Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we are back. First of all, listeners, thank you very much for making yesterday's show such a success. Judging by the amount of uh, downloads and listens and people sharing the show, the topic was certainly seemingly needed. And if you did not listen to yesterday's podcast, it is a part two of the series that I'm doing in, in reaction to a lot of you who are expressing to me that you're feeling a lot of stress and overwhelm. And the first podcast that I did on this was last Friday. Actually, it was on Sunday, Monday, um, and then Tuesday, obviously. And so I want you to listen to all those shows sequentially because what we're working up to is an exact system that does absolutely work 100% of the time with 100% of the people for making it so that you actually start to realize that really, and this is kind of counterintuitive, especially in the modern mindset movement and all the woo-woo that goes along with it, but negative thinking is actually something that's kept you alive. Negative thinking, believe it or not, is something that's hardwired into all of our brains and the way that all of us and all of our you know humanity in general has been able to exist. Because if it wasn't for negative thinking, you wouldn't have had a natural inclination nation to look for things that might harm you. And, and by you, I mean the you know, generations before you. The, we're talking back and you know, going all the way back to original man. The negative thoughts that were um, essentially everywhere in people's minds and still are to this day are from survival. They're from fight or flight. They're from something that's necessary to make it so you don't fall into a saber-toothed tiger's mouth, right? I mean, so go back and listen to yesterday's show. I don't want to um, you know, rehash too much of that. But based on the feedback that I got from all of you guys, uh, it was something that was definitely needed. And I was thrilled to be able to deliver that to so many of you. And again, go back and listen to yesterday's show. So the bottom line from yesterday's show was at the end of the day, you can't control the first negative thought. And frankly, the and negative thinking, and, and again, and I say this again, just because it is sort of um, not in the current zeitgeist, but it is true. Negative thinking, or at least a negative thought is not innately or necessarily a bad thing. It's what happens after that negative thought that becomes the bad thing. You can't control a negative thought. You can't control the thoughts that pop into your head. You just can't. And, you know, we're taught in, the, again, the modern mindset movement and all the woo-woo. It's, you know, you're supposed to root out what the thought was, why you had the thought, what the meaning of the thought is, and blah, 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 blah. And then you just are wasting, you know, lifetimes worth of, of unnecessary cycle analyzing your own emotions and thoughts with, you know, no real end in sight. Because, what happens is when you start thinking about all those thoughts that we're told uh, to think about, it just creates more negative thinking. And you're just essentially now stuck in a cesspool of negative thoughts and there's no room for anything in your life other than, guess what, more negative thoughts. So the I, I think the revelation that many of you guys experienced yesterday listening to the show was negative thinking is perfectly normal and there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, But you know what? It's It's been part of what's kept humanity in existence. Because in the story I told yesterday, a couple of you uh, told me that you really liked the story, so I'll tell it again. Imagine you know you're walking in your you, you're a, you, you're a savage, right? This is back in uh, medieval, not even medieval. Listen to me. This is back in caveman times, right? And you're walking with your little family, and you're about to walk into a forest. And just imagine, you know, long beards. You guys, you know, the, the, everyone smells kind of, you know, special. Let's say carrying your bats, and everyone's wearing fur, and you know, something out of the you know prehistoric times is what I'm trying to describe to all of you have in your in your heads, right? Now you're walking. You're about to walk into, let's say, a, a forest, and out walks. A another small family. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to ask that other small family about anything that they experienced as they were walking through the forest that might, you know, be something that you need to know about so that you can avoid it if it was indeed something that would maybe, for example, eat you. And they're going to ask you the same thing about the direction you just came. Now, that's exchanging, in essence, negative thoughts, isn't it? But without the negative thinking, you never would have, you know, again, you would have been uh, the generations and thousands of years ago of humanity. We wouldn't have been in existence today because there's those negative thoughts and seeking the negative information that helped us to avoid things that would have potentially harmed us. That's all it is. And so it's part of your root software in your brain. It, you, and you can't root it out. You can't get rid of it. It's never going it, to go away. 
So stop trying because in the trying, you actually create the problem, <laughs> okay? That's the, that's the paradox to all of this. In the trying, get rid of your negative thinking. You actually create the actual problem with having negative thinking because at the end of the day, you can't get rid of it. It's part of all of humanity and that's just the way it is. But what you can control, and this is moving on to my next point, is you can control what happens after that first negative thought. So the negative thinking that you have, um, and essentially the negative thinking that everyone has, is again, something that's innate. Innate meaning you can't get rid of it. It's part of how all of our brains are designed. And it's a survival mechanism. But in modern uh, life, the negative thinking doesn't really do anything to you because there's really not that much out there that's gonna cause you actual harm. And But you still react the same way um, as if you were still back walk about walking uh, about to walk into that forest, right? You still your brain still looks for the same uh, inputs of negative information, and everything around you knows that. So media knows that. Uh, social networking knows that. That's the reason that people actually prefer bad news when it comes to media, and and they you can't get look at just when you're uh, you know channel surfing, which I encourage you never to do. But if you do happen to you know bounce around looking at the devil, different cable channels, do you ever see good Good news? No. And there was a, uh, I think it was a newspaper um, that Julie knows about this. She studied it actually. A, new, a newspaper or a magazine. Now this was out like back in the 70s or the 80s and it was only good stories, right? Only things that, you know, would make you smile and, you know, just those sort of things. Well, it, it failed miserably because nobody wanted to read it. You know, people wanted to read the bad stories. Again, this goes back to our root brains. There's nothing wrong with you for uh, wanting to seek out negative thinking because it's part of your software. It's part of who you are. Now, by telling you that and judging by the emails and whatnot I received from all of you, that was a bit of a weight off your shoulders because it gave you permission to not have to worry about why you have negative thoughts. Because, the again, the worrying about why you think the way you think is going to cause more negative thoughts and it's going to cause you to frankly spend your entire lifetime thinking you're defective where you're not, you're actually just normal. Now, let's move the conversation forward. Realize, that, and this is point number three, realize that feeling overwhelmed isn't something out of your control. Now, this is where we move. This is kind of the pivot here, right? It's actually a choice. And that goes with the word stress too. But again, go back and listen to the previous two shows so I don't have to re this doesn't have to be a rehash show. But feeling out of control or feeling overwhelmed um, that's again, that's an, the, the feeling of overwhelmed is essentially disorderly thoughts. It's thinking not in the right order. And, and I'm going to get to the system and how to organize all that. But the first thing I want you to do is realize that there's nothing wrong with you for feeling this way. Because when you realize that there's nothing wrong with you for feeling the way you feel, when you realize that everyone essentially experiences the same thing, I've discovered that, you know, from coaching a billion folks, that that generally speaking actually makes you realize that there is nothing wrong with you, like I just said. And then you're normal. And now here's how you solve the problem so you can maybe have a more organized manner of thinking. That's all that that's what we're working on. That's the the whole project this week on the podcast. But here's the here's the key. We talked about this yesterday. What you do is when you have that negative thought, what you need to start doing is looking for the physiological reaction to the negative thought. And I gave you guys uh, the one I shared with coaching clients, and actually this worked with me as well. When I identify a negative thought, so this requires you being introspective, or at least requires you being observant of, observant of your thinking. When you're observant of your thinking and you see the negative thought pop in your head, it does not matter what it is. Don't allow, or at least, I mean, I make it sound simple, and I know it's not simple. You actually have to work on this. But when you have that first negative thought, the worst thing you can do is allow that negative thought to then become another one. So you can have a negative thought about yourself right now. You're not smart enough. You're too old. You're too young. You know, you're not good looking enough. You're not whatever it is enough, right? You can easily have your mind full of healthy enough, rich enough, poor enough. Doesn't matter. You can easily come up with a negative thought. And I'm, I'm sorry if I just gave you a bunch of them right there. Okay. But what happens is, is after you have that first negative thought, here's the game. You don't allow it to manifest another one. And so if you're observant of yourself, and again, I'm going to say this because I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not unknowing that this is a hard thing to develop. But when you're observant of how you feel and you're observant of how you th your feelings are basically going to be the barometer of your thoughts ultimately. But when you're observant of how you feel and then you're observant of what you're actually thinking as a result of your feelings, then what's going to happen is it's going to give you the ability to then decide. In other words, your higher brain is going to then decide how it chooses to react. Okay? So I'll give you an example. 
let's say you are in an environment and everyone's been in a situation like this. It can be with a customer, another real estate agent. It can be with your spouse. It could be with anybody. It doesn't matter. Where all of a sudden you start feeling maybe negative thinking about the other person or about yourself. You just are somehow, some way starting to feel a little bit out of control, stressed. You guys get the uh, idea of what I'm talking about. It could just be in a, a, a toward negotiation. It could just be when you come across a seller that just doesn't seem to be respectful and all of this. And then what happens is you then go into reaction mode. And reaction mode could result in maybe um, you saying things that you would have wished you wouldn't have said, certainly not thinking uh, clearly. You then start spinning off in other directions. And if it's a customer, you might lose the business. If it's a friend, you might lose the friend. If it's a spouse, you might, you know, you guys get the point here, right? And so what happens is, is that if you don't stop yourself at the first First negative thought and you allow your brain to go crazy looking for more things that manifest as far as negative thinking, then you're going to be stuck in this vortex and it's very difficult to escape from it. Now, that can become a lifestyle. I've had, I can't say I've had coaching clients like this because generally speaking, people that are stuck in this cycle don't seek coaching. They generally, you get, generally speaking, I'll get coaching clients. Now, obviously not in all of our programs. We've had tens of, tens of thousands of clients. I'm making this statement in, a, in such a broad way that it might not make sense. But So let me, let me bring it in a little bit. My own personal coaching clients over the years, I've certainly had all of them, and I've helped all of them work through their negative thinking. But I have to say, for the most part, most of them weren't plagued with negative thinking. They were just plagued basically with confusion about how to build their business and maybe a lack of skill set. That is generally speaking what the issues I deal with at the level of the clients that I uh, personally coach. Now, it is easy to find people that are stuck in these lifelong cycles of negative thinking. And what they'll start doing is they'll start essentially trying to reinforce the thoughts, the negative thinking with more negative thinking. That's how your brain works. That's how all of our brains work. And it goes back to that root software again. So again, Think about your own behavior. How much time do you spend sort of like, you know, surf, doom surfing? Isn't that what they call it? Doom scrolling, right? How much time do you actually spend seeking bad information? Do you realize you do that almost unconsciously or subconsciously? Do you do that? You realize you do that because when you find that little, you know, piece of bad news, your brain actually gives you a little dopamine hit. You actually get, it hits the pleasure center when you read something bad. And so you just, I'm not going to say addicted, but it becomes a bad habit at the very least, right? So that becomes essentially not just your immediate world, but then you start surrounding yourself with things that reinforce that sort of lifestyle of negative thinking. Then you start watching the news all the time. Then you start spending too much time on social media. And then it gets even worse. You start infecting the people around you, your family, your your friends or the people that you know are thinking like you're thinking. I was, as I was just thinking, as I was just uh, talking, I have a, uh, there's a coaching client that I had. And I won't say his name because I know he's a show listener. But he is somebody that like when I get him on the podcast, I can tell, I, I'm sorry, on our coaching call, I could actually tell, name's Gary, when he actually had been spending time on some of these things that reinforce the negative thinking. I could tell because he would come to the coaching call not having done anything. His voice would sound different. He would be in this sort of dark mode, essentially, is what I called it, right? Remember on your new iPhone, you have dark mode and light mode? Well, when he'd been absorbing all this negative type thinking that reinforced his own, he was in dark mode. He he did no business. He lost all of his enthusiasm. And it was like a little narcotic he'd give himself when he had enough deals and contracts. So like as soon as he had some financial security, he went, he just jumped right back into that mental emotional cesspool. And he had a lot of friends there and people would, you know, congeal on Facebook and and I and I would get his Facebook feed occasionally and I'd see the crap that he was posting. And yes, I did defriend him because I didn't want that in my life. But the reality of it is, is that's normal nowadays. And it's constantly being reinforced everywhere you go. One of the points I'm going to share with you guys, hopefully tomorrow is going to be about media free, which is one of the best things you can do for yourself. Um, it's an absolute 100% surefire way to make yourself feel emotionally better. And it will be funny when I get to that point because you know, you will go through a, a, an actual um, withdrawal process when you start purging media from your life. You will feel yourself actually missing it. Kind of like if I ever tried to give up coffee, <laughs> I'm not going to do it because I know how painful it is. But you, you, that's that's the sense of what happens when you give up media. I mean, Julie and I gave up media. We are not uh, consumers of media of any variety. We do listen to podcasts. 
And we haven't, honestly, for years. And I, sometimes I'll have somebody, like this morning, I had somebody asking me about, like, I was, um, you know, they're, I, I won't tell you the context of it, but they're reflecting on the uh, recent election, asking me if I'd heard about whatever, whatever. And of course I hadn't because I don't pay attention to the media because it does nothing, it does nothing to put me in a position or mentally or emotionally or certainly financially to be a better servant to all of you guys and to the people I love in my life. It does nothing to make me a better version of myself. It just tears me down because I am, look, I can't defend myself from all the negative thinking, especially if I was being hit over the head constantly with it like you guys, many of you choose to do through your, you know, what you're viewing, what you're reading, what you're watching, who you're listening to. So I would strongly suggest that when you're going through the process of, okay, I don't want to feel overwhelmed anymore. I know emotionally I need to clear the decks so that I can have a really, you know, fantastic next year. All of us, this is getting back to what I talked about on Sunday. All of us are carrying an unusual amount of emotional baggage as a result of this year. And you might not personally think you are, but you are. Maybe you had your best year ever. Maybe you had your, you know, a lot of our coaching clients, financially best years ever. Just unbelievable things happen. You know, ironically, uh, real estate was one of the only industries that did really great almost because of COVID. Isn't that crazy to think about? But it's true. So here's how this all sorts out. You might not personally think you're essentially you've absorbed any of this uh, sort of negative thinking, but people around you have, the news has, the media has, your customers have. And so there is a certain amount of emotional baggage that you need to give yourself permission to, you know, seek and destroy so that when you turn the, flip the calendar on 2000 to 2021, you can let all that go. You know, what's that song Zoe sings that our old daughter sings that let it go, let it go. <laughs> you guys with kids know what I'm talking about, right? I wish she was here. She could sing it for all of us. <laughs> she knows all the words. Anyway, so that is what we need to be working on. That's why I'm trying to help you guys work through this. So point number three is realize that feeling overwhelmed and feeling stress is something that, you know, enters into all of our lives and looking for negative information. And again, stop trying to think that you need to somehow eliminate negative thinking from your life because it's virtually impossible and the very act of trying to do that will make it so you feel more negative thinking. Because after all, you're not removing the negative thinking and you're working on the removing the negative thinking from your thoughts and you're reading all these books and listening to all these gurus and yet you're not doing it. So there might be something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? You guys get the point. Isn't that hilarious actually when you think about it logically? So you can't control the first negative thought, but you can control whether you're going to allow that first negative thought to manifest another one, which then will start the dominoes to fall. That's what I'm asking all of you to consider doing. Look for it in your head. Don't feed it with more energy. Don't ask where it came from. Don't ask why you're thinking the way you think. Don't think it's because, you know, something happened to you when you were a kid. Don't allow people to go around in your brain and start making you think that you're defective. Do not let any of that happen. And this is, again, I shared with you my own technique. Um, and I'm probably efficient at this maybe 90% of the time at this point, but I have to practice it constantly. It's nothing, I'll never perfect it. But when I have a negative thought, what I do, this is what I say to myself, honest to God, guys, this is what I say to myself. I'll identify the negative thought and I'll go, oh, I see you, you little son of a bitch. Nope, you're not going to be making any more negative thoughts in my head. You know, I will say that to myself in my head because I really want to put a stop to it. And then what happens is I become the observer of this negative thought. I actually can see it or feel it. I'm emotionally feeling it, but as an observer, and then I see like a balloon, it starts to, you know, it starts to lose all of its air until it just goes away. That is a practice skill that once you have it, you will then feel in control of where of when, frankly, you're going to allow yourself to feel you know, an unnecessary amount of fear. Sometimes fear has a purpose, truthfully. You know, sometimes you need to feel fear if you're in a, a situation that's, you know, fight or flight. And you need, that's, the, again, that goes back to original software and original programming. It's sort of a, a, it's a survival skill. And so is some of this negative thinking. So again, don't think there's anything wrong with you uh, because there's not. Um, so a great way to control your feeling when you're out of control is take ownership. And this is something also, this is the way that you can work towards developing the muscle to, uh, you know, essentially have that introspective ability to notice that first negative thought. Because right now the thoughts are dancing around in your head and you're not realizing that you can be an observer of your thinking, right? You can actually be almost a person looking in on your thoughts as they bounce around in your head. You can put yourself in that position, 
When you do that, when you become the observer of the sort of, you know, the brain that's operating like it's been operating, you start looking at it and you start seeing all these dancing around thoughts. You start seeing all these competing ideas and competing emotions and you start observing them and watching them. You don't have to judge them because judging them gives them power. You don't have to think about them. Think about giving them gives them power. Don't analyze them. Analyzing them gives them power. Don't try to figure out the genesis of them or the history of them. Don't think, don't give them any power. Just observe them. See them like if you were looking through a microscope into a petri dish or you're looking at an anthill at a bunch of little ants, right? So that's what I want you to think about. And when you become the observer of your thoughts, then what happens magically is that you then can decide which thought you're going to act on where right now your thoughts are just coming at you so randomly and, they're, and some of them are competing and have nothing to do with each other. And this, again, I'm going to really do everything in my power to make you guys understand that the more inputs you have from media, for example, the more of these types of thoughts you're going to have because you're going to say, you know what, maybe 2021 is going to be all right. Or maybe you wanted Trump to win and Biden won. And maybe now you're saying, oh, my gosh, maybe your, your you know, mental, emotional circle of friends are all thinking that somehow the world's going to come to an end because Biden won. I mean, assuming he won, right? Well, okay, then what, just observe that. Does that even make any sense? Of course it doesn't. But you're just stuck in this emotional vortex of you know negative thinking. And you're surrounding yourself with more things to reinforce those same thoughts. So observe it. Just look at them. Do that now. Can you, listeners, can you actually try? Just look, ask yourself, what are my, how do I feel right now? What, you know, what, what's, what are the thoughts that are, and just observe them. Do I feel hungry? Do I feel horny? Do I feel happy? Do I feel, okay, now drill down even further than that. Am I feeling a little overwhelmed? Am I feeling a little scared? I mean, just look to see how you're feeling. And just the act of observing your own emotions puts you in control of your emotions. Now, here's the mechanism that I prescribe to all of you. And I know, again, this is not a natural way of thinking, but this is a powerful way of thinking that puts you in control. I want you to think about the fact that everything in your life, it's called basically taking complete ownership. And that's what I want you to do. Take complete ownership of everything that happens in your life. Take complete ownership of even maybe some of the, the secondary and the third thoughts. Own everything. It, and here's, uh, I use this example because it, I think, I mean, until I can come up with a better one, this one makes the point the best. You are driving to, you know, Target or Starbucks or wherever you're going. And you park your car in a parking lot. You're, you know, you park right in the spot. Everything's perfect. You didn't do anything wrong. You know, you went in, got your coffee. Everything's great. You know, you wore your mask, you, you know, whatever, whatever. Everything was great. You come back out. And as you walk out of Starbucks, there's some person that's basically not, you know, being careful and they hit your bumper. No damage. Nobody's hurt. Nothing happens. But clearly this other person caused the damage to your car. Nobody in the face of the earth would say uh, that that's your fault, right? Everyone would say, oh, you know, Tim, Julie, Bob, you did, you know, this, you were in essence the victim of this person who weren't, wasn't paying attention and they hit your car. You are innocent. They are guilty. You are the victim and they committed a crime or they committed some sort of you know affront to you, right? Isn't that how you normally think? But don't think like that because when you think like that, what comes on the other side of it? Yes, it is true, right? In, in essence, that person did you know hit your car, but don't think in terms of they hit your car. Think in terms of if I hadn't parked in that spot at that particular time, right? If I had just come five minutes earlier or five minutes later, that wouldn't have happened. So in a way, I am responsible for the fact that my car got hit, right? So why am I asking you to consider this? Because when you adopt a, ma a mindset of ultimate responsibility, that everything happens to you, um, everything good, everything bad, everything indifferent, because of you, not because of anything else or anybody else. Like Zoe, her favorite thing to say is I didn't do it or it's not my fault, but she's not even seven years old yet. So that makes sense, right? <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I could tell you guys some hilarious stories, but I won't. But yes, yeah, so nothing very rarely. Now I have noticed that she's gotten older. 
um, that she stops. She's not saying that anymore. And that when she does something wrong, because she knows that it's not going to be something that's going to really result in that much bad things happening to her, because, you know, I mean, it's not like Julie and I are huge disciplinarians with her. But, you know, she knows that she's not going to be overly punished. And she trusts that we're going to have a metered response to whatever her infraction was. And so, and I've noticed now that she is uh, admitting when she does things, which is really fascinating, but she doesn't, she doesn't a little girl way where she just won't say anything, <laughs> you know, but that's better than it was maybe six months ago where it was always, it's not my fault. I didn't do it right. Where she in essence was lying because she's fearful what was going to happen. Now, if you come from a family that has overbear had an overbearing disciplinarian, your father, your mother, whoever, and you were absolutely living in fear of ever uh, committing even the smallest of infractions, you're always going to look and never going to feel comfortable taking ownership of things. And, you know, that's a normal human reaction because when you were a little kid, if you stepped out of line even ever so slightly and displeased your you know, your parents, that could cause you physical pain. And so your brain is wired, or emotional pain, your brain is wired to never want to take full responsibility. And But not taking responsibility actually has a huge uh, cost to it. Not, not saying it's your fault, not acknowledging that you created that in your life, not acknowledging the fact that this is something that you actually did to yourself, that actually creates more problems you can possibly imagine. And then you grow older and older and older. And once you, then you eventually wake up and you sort of maybe hear this podcast or have the revelation yourself that had you taken a different approach to these things that happened to you, if you started saying instead that happened to me, you start saying that was my responsibility. The, the the it was my responsibility thing does not have any emotional scar that follows it. When you say I was a victim, you then now have attached yourself to having to carry a victim, uh, you know, a, a lot of victim baggage, right? Now you've got some other problem with your you, that you have to work your way through. Whereas if you'd had the, uh, you know, essentially the presence of mind in consciousness to say, you know what, that was my fault. Everything that's good, bad, or indifferent that happens to me was based on my decisions, not based on something that happened to me. It was based on me being where I was when I was there. And as a result of that, basically, that put me in a position where, um, you know, I am now. Hey, Julie just walked into the podcasting studio. She's rushing to her, uh, take her, t you have a CE test right now? Okay, so Julie, you have to admit it's your fault that you waited two years to finish your CE. Absolutely, my fault. And now I'm suffering, so... <laughs> For the rest of you, schedule it now. That's right. She had two years to do it. It's due at the end of December, and now she's running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Good luck on I your test. Done today. How many more tests do you have? Just today. Just today. All right. So we're all rooting for you. Close both doors. I did it for them. <laughs> she, oh, oh, did you hear that, listeners? She said she procrastinated her CE for two years. She said she did it for you, which she was inferring so she could spend more time with coaching clients. Hmm. Sounds very suspect to me, doesn't it to you? So when you're experiencing, uh oh, she's back. You forgot your computer. That's important. Yeah, that is important. Good luck. Thank you. See ya. Bye. So it's again. Let's just start with the idea and the the, the acceptance of the fact that you can't control the first negative thought, but you can control whether you have more negative thoughts that come after that. And let's also accept the fact that one of the ways that you can start building the muscles of stopping the negative thoughts that follow the first one, which again, you can't control the first one, are starting to have a life of ultimate uh, responsibility for everything that happens to you, good, bad, or indifferent. And when you do that, guys, you're going to feel actually, first of all, you're going to go through, it's, it's not easy, it's painful. And, you know, I've had coaching clients and even I even remember going through this with myself because we're all none of us. How No one teaches you how to think like this. No one does. And I learned it from coaching clients. I learned it from studying more successful people. You don't see successful people blame others. True leaders will take responsibility for even, you know, the, the mistakes of their subordinates. They won't try to pass the buck. Um, bad leaders, if you want to call them, if that's even a way of saying it. I'll say fake leaders, they're the ones that never want to take responsibility. Because if you hire someone to work for you and they screw up and you know you then blame them for their screw up, well, technically that's right. It is their screw up. But guess what, jackass? You're the one that hired them and you're the one that's supposed to be managing them. And so you have to take responsibility for the mistake that they made because it happened on your watch. That's the level of accountability and personal responsibility that I'll strongly suggest all of you guys have. If anything is you know out of place in your life, if you're not liking the direction that you're going into your life, and maybe that's also lending a lot to your um, your stress and 
and your unease and your, you know, essentially your lack of mindfulness, go back to the fact that maybe you're spending too much time not being uh, essentially accountable and owning the situation that you found yourself in. And that leads to guess what? More feelings of overwhelm and more senses of stress. Does that make sense? Good. Now, I'm going to move on to the next point. Um, Let's see. Point number four. Let me make sure everything is working correctly. Yep. Point number four. Now, I'm going to actually edit my notes here because I don't like what I wrote down. So I'm going to do something else. All right. Point number four. I'm, um, I wrote down pinpoint the primary source of overwhelm, but I like this better. A business more, it's simpler. And it's also, this is also in our book, Harris Rules. Every single day, you should, con- well, start out starting today, you should do a complete brain dump. Write down every single thing. Now, someone did show me how to do this, actually. This was years ago, like when I was in college. Um, But write down every single thought that's in your head. Really, I'm telling you, you're going to need tablets of paper. If you write down three or four things, you're just not taking it seriously. And I want those things not just to be the to-do items, but those are good too. But the negative thoughts that you have, that you know, the, everything that's floating around your head, and write and write and write. Write until your fingers hurt, or type until your fingers hurt. But the point of it is, I want you to get everything that's out in your head onto a piece of paper. Now, you're going to see that when you do that, you're going to start uh, having a, more of a sense of control because things are out of your head. Now, here's here's how it works. When you're doing this, you're going to write all the things down and you're going to say, wow, I have no more thoughts. I have no, I'm completely purged of all the, you know, the bouncing around of thoughts and emotions and feelings I had. And then as soon as you say that, you're going to have a lot more bounce around and create a lot more. Write those things down too. Root them all out. Get it all out on paper. Get it just clear, completely purge everything out of your mind. Don't look at it. Don't judge what you're writing. Don't worry about ordering things. Don't say, well, now I'm going to write down all the you know, stuff I'm worried about with regards to the holidays. Don't, and then you're going to have this you know, section in your notes of your list that's all going to be holiday focused or maybe it's going to be on finances. You can do, do it that way if you want to, if that helps you uh, concentrate or helps you to really drill down. But at the end of the day, don't worry about it because there's an excellent chance that your thoughts are not organized um, anyway. They're all random as they are. So just let write down everything as it flows into your head. And some of you, it's going to take hours. This might even be like a day-long project where you just work on it in between other things. But when you do that, when you completely purge your mind of all your thinking, and you get to the point where you're drained, right? You and maybe you start repeating yourself, and you realize, well, okay, maybe I can start rounding the bend on this. You know, this writing down all my thoughts, negative, positive, everything. Now you're at that point. Don't look at what you wrote down. Don't think about what you wrote down. Notice how you feel. Tune into how you feel. Now, you're going to experience the spectrum, right? Because you now have, if you did this seriously, you have rooted out all of the thoughts that were in your head that were causing you to feel overwhelmed that you didn't even consciously realize. So you could start writing down, for example, maybe you have some, I don't even want to give you guys examples because then you'll start manifesting negative thoughts, but just work with me conceptually and intellectually here. As you're writing these things down, don't just write down surface things. Don't just write down, let me give you something that won't hopefully cause you too much anxiety. Let's say, for example, you know that your listing presentation sucks, right? You know you don't really have one. It's something you need to work on. Don't just write down my listing presentation sucks. You've got to write down all the thoughts that go along with that. Because then if your listing presentation sucks, that means you probably feel anxiety about presenting. You probably feel anxiety about you know, proactive lead generation. You write all of it down. This is your opportunity to do a complete cleanse of your thinking. Take it seriously. And again, once you write these things down, don't start thinking about them or thinking why you think the way you think. What I want you to do is pay attention to your feelings because what you're going to start to do and you're going to feel this and it's going to feel, it's going to, depending on how seriously you take this project and how long you take to do it, you're going to start to feel a separation from the sense of stress and overwhelm um, and from your emotions. You're going to actually start to feel almost like there's a big, huge piece of extra strength, industrial, military grade Velcro that's starting to pull itself apart. Just imagine the sound of that Velcro slowly pulling itself apart. So what that is, it's the negative thinking that you had that it stuck itself to basically who you really are. 
So you're going to sense, and, and trust me when I tell you, those negative thoughts are not going to want to release themselves because they've been hardwired into maybe even how you see yourself. Maybe you actually believe that you're too old and maybe you've built so many negative thoughts around that you build a lifestyle around you know, thinking you're too old. Maybe you think you're not smart enough or you're thinking you're too smart. I've had coaching clients and you know, I'm too smart for real estate. I just, this is up, 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 whatever, right? Write it all down. We don't need to judge it or we don't need to talk about it. But write it all down, and then as you write all these things down, again, I'm going to say this for the third time because it's critical, don't empower them or start doing a lot of cycle, you know, personal cycle an- analyzing um, because that doesn't really get you anywhere. Try to do this quick. Try to go with first thoughts. Try to go with the thoughts that pop right into your mind. You guys should do this. You know, experience what I'm asking you to, you know, considering, a- <laughs> I'm trying to say this nicely, experience what I'm asking you to do here because at the other end of this, leading into the future points, you'll start to sense a, a, a real clearing. You'll start to feel this sense of control. You'll start to feel like, you know how it is after you've gotten a really good night's sleep and you wake up at least for maybe the first 10 or 15 or you know 20 minutes and of course some of you, what do you do? You grab your iPhones or whatever and you start reading all the negative crap again and then boom, there goes that you know nice hit, you know refresh from the night's sleep. You understand what I'm saying. Uh, but you're going to sense that uh, feeling of presence. And remember, on Sunday, I talked about the fact that really what causes most stress, and when you're going through this list, I want you to be observant of this, is that most of the things, if not all of the things that you're going to write down are rooted with you worrying about or thinking about things that happened in the past or things that you're fearful are going to happen in the future. In other words, your stress, my stress, everyone's stress and overwhelm. Stress and overwhelm is sort of in the same bucket, Right. They come from not being present, not being in the moment present, not being in the moment present with your surroundings, with the smells, with the sights, with the people, with the feelings, because you're, I'm going to say the word, I know it's confusing, but it's true because your ego or your negative thinking wants you to worry. It wants you to stay in that mode of worrying about, because remember, it's part of all of our root software. It's a survival mechanism. It's part of our lizard brains. It's part of, I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of ways of explaining it, but the theory of evolution is, is that we all started out with these lizard brains and then we had developed more advanced brains to the modern human brain. But what happened is, so as, you know, as a essentially new brains evolved. It's sort of like loading in new software. So your original operating system, essentially, it's still there, right? The one you were born with. And you've hopefully loaded in new operating systems over the years. But sure enough, the old versions of the operating system are still bouncing around in your brain. They're still there. Uh, And unless you are really intentional and purposeful, the older you get, the more you're going to have some of the older operating system that's slowing down or not even maybe preventing the new operating system from even working. You know, it's funny, speaking of operating systems, I was reading that the, uh, I shouldn't laugh at this because some of you might be suffering from this. You bought new Mac computers, right? And they updated the um, iOS to this new, uh, I love the name, Big Sur. If you guys have never been to Big Sur in Central California, wah! Amazing. When you're there, when you go there, or if you live near there, go to a park called Point Lobos. Probably, I'll, I'll give you an extra advanced tip. Go, there's several places to park, but park at the very last parking area. Um, and then you're going to have what could only be described as a truly spiritual, magical experience. It is unbelievably gorgeous. Go on to um, Google or YouTube and maybe see what I'm talking about. But oh, it's one of the Julie and I's favorite places on planet Earth. That's for sure. So point Lobos and make sure you park in the furthest parking lot from the entrance and then go on the walk. It's incredible. But as you so the new operating system is called uh, Big Sur. So guess that get this. So if you tried to load the new operating system on some Macs. It doesn't just not load, but it actually locks your new your computer up. So if you're trying to load the new iOS called Big Sur into your old Mac, I should have said it differently before, then it could actually cause your old Mac, and they call it bricking, where essentially it just becomes a brick. It just locks up and it doesn't work anymore. And that's I, I love that as an analogy for trying to load in new thinking into the way that basically we essentially, um, you know, how we actually think, how, how we actually relate, how we actually exist. And, and that happens is that your old iOS could actually be slowing you down. And it's not going to leave any room for essentially the new software to be loaded. And as you go through all these exercises, if you kind of walk through this process with me, and again, this, isn't, this is a process that 
Uh, I didn't read anywhere. Julie and I just picked it up. Mostly what we'll do is from having done um, literally, again, I don't even, over 100,000, probably more like two or 300,000 personal one-on-one coaching calls. Julie, the same. Our other coaches, the same. A huge amount of time on the phone talking to real estate agents. What you discover over time is that you have to, you know, you, you work on how to help people, right? If that's, you know, if you're going to be a good a coach, you want to be the best one you possibly can. And so you think through how to help this person with this particular problem. And then you start seeing the people that so many different people have the same exact problem. And then you start working on it on a, a higher level. And then maybe you start reading and you start studying once you've identified this is a common issue. Because if you're integrity, if you have, if you have integrity, you obviously want to help your clients. And so in order for you to help your clients, you have to move past in some cases just the normal rigmarole of real estate skills. And that's what Julie and I've done for a living. Um, and so these are the things that we've learned work for folks as we're helping them through the process of getting in control of their thinking and their stress. Because here at the end of the day, the bottom line, and please remember everything we talked about, especially from the last three days, the bottom line is you are in control of your stress. You are in control of whether or not you're going to feel overwhelmed. You are in control of whether or not you're going to choose to have negative thoughts. Not the first one. But the second one, and you are in control whether or not you're going to let that second thought manifest. And that's, a again, it's a muscle that you have to work on, but it's a revelation the first time you actually do it. The first time you actually catch that little negative booger in your head trying to manifest into more little negative boogers, the first time you catch it, the first time you identify it, the first time you see it, and it knows you see it, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be weird here, I'm just trying to make a point, right? But the first time it knows you see it, and then you realize just by observing it, you have control over it. You don't have to, you don't have to actually think to yourself uh, anything about it, you just have to look at it. Remember, look, looking at an anthill kind of analogy, looking through, you know, looking into a Petri dish, that kind of thing. You're not actually affecting the ants or the whatever that's in the Petri dish through the microscope, you're just observing. That's all you have to do. And if you try to do any more than that, if you try to doctor fill yourself, you're then going to essentially be, the whole exercise goes to, goes to not because you're going to be sucked into having more negative thoughts. So just observe it and realize and be on the lookout for that first negative thought. And when you have it, it I'll tell you, here's another little interesting advanced tip here. And I shared this with you guys on Sunday or Monday. The negative thoughts always start with a spark of physiology. So your thought com- uh, comes after you have a little bit of a uh, fire flight that pops into your uh, your body. And for me, I know it manifests because I obviously have worked on this for a long time and, and by no means I'm an expert at it, but I am observant of it. When I get this little feeling, this little sort of like, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's again, it's, it's anxiety, it's stress, it's... Um, you know, it's just a little bit of craziness. And I feel this little, it manifests right in my center core. When I start to feel that, and I'm sure some of you guys who know more about physiology will tell me that's where whatever gland is, and this is what you're experiencing, and you're just observant of the release of this dopamine chemical, whatever, 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 okay? I have never stated to that extent. It didn't really matter to me, to be honest with you. What mattered to me was, is once I feel that feeling, okay, then I know what's going to come after that. It's going to be a negative thought. And so if I feel that feeling, boom, I'm in the observer's position looking for that thought to pop in. Now, here's what's happened since I've worked on this for so long. And I remember the first time I discovered this, it was when I was probably about 32 or 33. The first time I actually started to experiment with this. And the first time I actually, I do remember the first time, Julie and I were actually in Laguna Beach. And I remember the first time I caught that thought. I, the first time I thought it, I felt it. Soon as I went through that experience, On the other side of that, I cannot tell you how amazing I felt. I wasn't like self-congratulatory where I was saying, look what you did. You you actually did it. No, it wasn't that. It was just that I was the observer of my thinking. And as a result of that, I noticed that basically that negative thought just essentially dissipated right before my eyes or essentially, you know, emotionally it dissipated. That's the same exercise that all of you guys can experience. Now, again, this is the type of show Julie and I do this time of year because a lot of you are winding down your real estate businesses and, you know, we're wanting you to basically clear the emotional decks so you can have a fantastic start to your year. And I'm cautioning all of you to make sure that you do a hard reset um, on essentially all aspects of your life. And we're going to be getting into new, um, you know, 
micro points with regards to that, helping you understand the importance of controlling your physicality, your finances, and your environment. We're going to start talking about the rest of this week, maybe even next week, other really core level things that you can be doing to make it so that when that calendar ticks over to 2021, you're like, not just, uh, you're excited. You're incredibly excited because you know you're more prepared than you ever have been. You, you're you happy even, right, at the opportunity to actually help people. You know what your purpose is. You know what you're supposed to be doing every single day. You know how to do it. You are 100% confident of the results that will come as a result of you doing those things. You have a plan. That's what I want for all of you guys. Now, by the way, speaking of plans, if you've not downloaded your real estate treasure map, that is your fill-in-the-blank business plan. And all you've got to do, and um, uh, this is, again, I'm going to caution all of you that this is really going to happen. December 1st, we're shutting down the free coaching program. We started it um, with the uh, COVID outbreak, you know, and this, we didn't know what was going to happen with housing and the economy. And Julie and I had to do whatever it took for us to help as many of you as we can. Um, and we had thousands of you that enrolled into the free coaching program. And it's, I'm in retrospect, it was one of the best things we ever did because so many of you guys um, were so grateful and thankful. And I appreciate that. But we're going to end it December 1st. Why? Because, frankly, the economy and housing have clearly turned a corner. And we don't need to do a free coaching program anymore. And we're running a business here. And we don't run a nonprofit. So the free coaching program is coming to an end on uh, you know the end of this month, beginning of December. And if you're not in the free coaching program yet, just text the word SURVIVAL to 31996. Text the word survival to 31996. So we're going to be really drilling down on additional points in the same um, mental space. And I want you to really continue to do whatever you can to keep your mind open and allow yourself to realize that none of this stuff that I'm sharing with you is really that cerebral. It doesn't require that much work. It doesn't require years and years and years. Now, granted, what I just told you is something that if you're conscious of it, you get better at it. As soon as you have that first, you know, it's like an epiphany. It's like aha moment. As soon as you have the ability to be the observant of the negative thought and you see the negative thought just dissipate, once you have that afterwards, once you know you can do it, it's actually easy. It's like the four minute mile. Once that was done, you know, no one thought it could be done, but as soon as it's done, a whole bunch of other people start doing it. Now it's a relatively normal thing in like high schools and colleges, right? Same thing will happen for you the first time you identify the thought. But every single thing that Julie and I are going to ask you to do is not a cerebral, long-term, lifelong, you know, no, it's practical and tactical. Our whole mission is to help you to be put in a position where you can help people solve their problems and you can be of service to other people. The highest and truest purpose of all this on planet Earth is being of service to other people. When we're in that mode of being of service to other people, on the other side of that is everything you want in life. On the other side of that is clarity. But where it gets confusing is where you let too much of the stress and this feeling of overwhelm and too much media and all these other things start to uh, dominate your thoughts. And when you allow that to happen, you're not anywhere near being in alignment with your highest and truest purpose, which is being of service to other people, which by the way, I just foreshadowed point number 17. Okay. So there it is. If you guys need me for anything, obviously feel free to text me. It's 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. And if you are in Julie's premier coaching program, please do do me a favor and absolutely make fun of her for procrastinating for two years to do her CE. And those of you who are in Texas where Julie's license is, not only is it a ridiculous state to get your license in the first place, as far the amount of hours, but the amount of hours it takes to get your CE done equally as onerous. <laughs> so those of you in Texas, making sure you're paying attention to that because the CE has obviously been a big deal for Julie and, and she should have been doing it consistently over the last two years, but such is the way. So make sure you poke her a little bit because it is kind of ironic, don't you think, <laughs> that she procrastinated it? Even though she wrote a book in Harris Rules about procrastination, I think that's kind of funny anyway. So you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.